thankful now for this opportunity where we can study things that relate to your word and things we believe, believe that will help us to better understand the word as we study. Guide us in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I know when you look at this, you think daily life in the Bible kind of it looks a lot more like daily life in the old city of Jerusalem. And that's true. I just uh, chose that picture. I'll be talking about some of these plants later on. And some people here were inquiring or wondering, what does it do? You know, what are these things down here in the corner? Uh, those are green almonds. And in Jordan, particularly, where I haven't seen it, and I have some others to show, uh, where boys are selling these in little bags, like a dollar a bag or whatever, green almonds. Everything, everything. So you got different ways that you can do that. So what I want to do now is to continue where we were last time, talking about uh, these various things. So we talked about the part partitions of the land, and we talked about number one, this mountain range that runs all the way from Lebanon Mountain down through the uh, area of uh, Samaria, well, through Galilee, through Samaria, all the way down to the city of Jerusalem, and so on. This only shows as far as Samaria, but it continues on that. And then on the, in the transjoining area, which begins in the anti lebanon mountains, we have that continuing on down through uh, what we know today as Jordan. Bible times, it was the area of the Tetrarch of Philip, also the Capitalist, and so on. Today it's Jordan, and we could go on up and talk about Syria, things of that kind. So these are, this is where we're going to continue. I talked about the topographical cross sections of the land, and if we look over to the your left, that would be to the west. And that would be the Mediterranean Sea. And there at the Mediterranean Sea, we can recognize that it's a coastal plain. Uh, that plain, incidentally, was not really used much in Bible times, except in the very southern portion. And that's where the Philistines, the sea people of some sort, from somewhere, moved into that region. They became a thorn in the side of the children of Israel for a long, long time. And then you can move in the inland, and you have, where it says Lod, you have this area that is referred to as Shephela. That's easy to say. It's not hard to say. Say she. 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 So that is a very important uh, area. Uh, our English versions would use some term like the coastal, uh, not the coastal, but the lowlands, see, or the hill country. Not the mountain country, but the hill country. And so you come in on the coast, and then you begin to go up just a little bit, and then finally you come up to the mountain range. And when you get to the mountain range, then you come to a city like Jerusalem. I was thinking about the picture, and really probably we would put them in, but ran out of time to do that. But when you come to Jerusalem, you are actually over the highest point. Jerusalem is on the east side of the highest point of the mountains in Jerusalem. And so you can go to that, that point peak in the city and look over and see the valleys that run around it. You see the entire city and then of course it goes on down to the Mediterranean Sea, I mean to the Dead Sea. So after that you would go to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives are higher than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about 2,400 feet above sea level. Mount of Olives is 2,600 feet so if you were on Jerusalem flat, you could not see beyond there. But if you go to one of the taller buildings, then you might even be able to see 
all the way to the Dead Sea. So looking further over here, you see we begin to go down, and we not only go down to sea level, meaning Mediterranean and so on, but we go below sea level. And the Dead Sea, we used to always say, when I was in school, we learned it was, it was 1,297 12, feet below sea level, right? Something like that. And uh, nowadays, it's like 13.8 or more. And the reason is that it's drying up. And that is, again, the water problem that I mentioned for you, that you've got to have water. Syria wants the lake field, Galilee, Israel wants that, and so on and so on. So then when you go down to that, then if you wanted to go up into Jordan, you go to the Trans-Jordan Plateau, and this Trans-Jordan Plateau is about 3,000 feet of sea level. So the Trans-Jordan Plateau, and it's not exactly a level place. It is hilly. And when you go there, then you are higher than you would be in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is not the highest place, and many have argued that it was not the best place to build the capital of the country, you know, and that the Jordan River is not the best place to have a port. So there are a lot of things to consider about that. But we'll leave that alone for other people. <coughs> All right, now, Coastal Plain, the Shabayla, then after that, the Circle Mountain Range, and then after that, see, in the south, you could call that the Judean Mountains, in Samaria, the mountains of Samaria, and in Galilee, you would have, you'd have another division, Lower Galilee and Upper Galilee, talk about that later right on, and then the Transjordan Plateau. I had this chart, one chart left over from last time that I want to talk a little bit about. I'll let you take a look at it. And you can see these geomorphological regions of Palestine. And you notice now the number A you have. Make sure I get the right button. You have, I'm getting the light out of that. Okay, you have the A, and the A is, and that's the Shabayla, coastal plain. And then after that, you have B. I added the H because they didn't have it on there, but it's widely recognized. And so the H is the Shabayla. And then you have the B, and the B is the hill country. And after that, you have the Dead Sea Rift okay, over here is the Transjordan Plateau. Uh, he mentions the importance also, the person who put this together in the Anchor Bible uh, Dictionary, mentioned the importance of the Negev. And when you go to, from Jerusalem, and you go south, and you come to Beersheba, they say Beersheba. When you come to Beersheba, from there south, that is the Negev and it's translated in many English Bibles as the South Land, the South. And uh, the further south you go, the drier it gets. The further east you go, the drier it gets. And we're gonna talk about weather in a little bit, so we'll have a little understanding of some of those things. I wanted to say just a word or two about the uh, uh, earthquake. And I have a chart in here last week. In fact, I think it's here. I think I'll go in. I'll show you where this is, and then we'll look at the chart that I wanted to, to see. Uh, this is where the earthquake hit in Turkey. Now, if you read my blog this week, I only got out one. Did you read it? What did I talk about? What? The earthquake. The earthquake. The earthquake. The earthquake and what city? Aleppo? I can't remember. Well, I did mention Aleppo, but I, it was a city where the disciples were called Christians first. Oh. Antioch. Antioch of 
Syria, only Antioch of Syria, meant Roman Syria. Antioch is today in Turkey. Since 1935, they've been in Turkey. So Antioch is in Turkey. What is it called? Antakya. So there was serious damage in Antakya. And I included a photograph of the city built on the uh, slopes of a mountain and on the Orontes River, very important uh, significance to that. And uh, maybe, I don't know if, if the coastal place where, like where Paul sailed from, Seleucia, I don't know if that was a, a hurt or not. But I read this afternoon that there was damage to the, to the new museum there that has just wonderful mosaic floors, for example, from the Roman period, and lots of other interesting things. Now, also Aleppo was hit, and that's in northern Syria, and these towns that are further north in uh, Gaziantep, and Karaman, and uh, Diamond, uh, these places are all places that I have been and have traveled. I mean, I've spent nights in every one of uh, the major cities. And Adana was hit, and then if you go further east, even some damage to Sanli Urfa. They call it Shanli Urfa. And according to Muslim tradition, that, which is right on the border with Syria, that is a place where Abraham was born. That's their tradition about that. And they have the cave where he was born, and so on and so on. So a lot of things. They have a place where he performed miracles, a lot of interesting things. So then look at, look at what you have here. Let's take a look now at this chart. This is the information. I may have shown this, did I? This is the earthquake information. Now this comes from Bible Mapper. Bible Mapper is a good source to find information about Scripture. I'm not having any luck there. That's it, right? I'm going to do that. Ah, good. Bible Mapper is where you can find these maps. Excellent maps for teachers to use. And then if you look up here, you see that this is this See that red line? This is in Iran. Here's Iraq. This goes all the way up like this, past none of it. It curves then to the west, and it comes over to the border with Syria, comes down here to Antioch. See, just like in the Bible times, Antioch. It comes down to Damascus, on down through Israel and all the way into Africa. So that is the range. Now this was felt in Israel. This earthquake was felt there. It was felt in Egypt and many other places throughout that part of the world. So a very significant place. So let's talk about the earthquakes a little. Not exactly the weather, but you know, it affects the people a great deal as you no. So in the Bible, we read about earthquake in the time of Uzziah, Amos, Isaiah, and Micah. All of those are roughly the same period of time. And the Bible mentions them and uh, uh, mentions the earthquake in that day. And then from that time onward, there will be people remembering the earthquake the first year after the earthquake and so on. And it's just like people remember the Chicago fire and like we remember that snow in whatever year that was. And uh, because when something like that happens, it's not something that's happening every day and every year, but it is something that is significant to us. Uh, notice also that when we come to the New Testament, we have a reference to an earthquake when Jesus died on the cross. And beyond that, then, we have a reference to an earthquake when Paul is in Philippi in prison and all of the shackles and everything were loosened at that time 
and the jailer, you know, was about to take his life until Paul taught him the truth and said, we're all here, and then he spoke the word of the Lord to him. <clears throat> we have a lot of examples of earthquakes. In the archaeological evidence, there will be evidence that there was an earthquake at certain periods of time. And one that's rather significant because you can go see it is in Bethshan, or Bethshean, the town is pronounced over there. And uh, they left parts of the ancient city from the 600s, the 8th, 8th century, the 700s, and uh, they show them there just like they were found when they, see all this was covered with earth. And when they excavated, they found here the way the city was left after the earthquake at that period of time. So apparently then people just moved away from it and then later on it was free to be excavated. So that's true a lot of times. But many, in many places you will find examples of earthquakes. Pearl, the time I went back to South Africa and I joined you on the tour, you took us to a place called Baalbek and it was like this. Was that earthquake damage? Uh, no, I don't think it was, but I'm not sure. But Baalbek is in the in the, the Ka Valley between the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon mountains. Remember that? Yeah. Went from Damascus to there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the punch of the promotion of the tour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good deal. Uh, this uh, little map shows you where things will grow. After tonight's lesson, the next lesson will be beginning to be where things will grow. I mean, what you grow in this place. So we're going to talk about the agriculture. We want to talk about the, the things that the people could have to live on. You see, what I'm doing is this. It's intentional. What I'm doing is intentional. I'm trying to help you understand about the land, about the climate, the rain, the weather, the earthquakes, various things of that sort of the land, so that you will then understand what products they could grow, where they could live, etc. It's not just everywhere that you could grow things. And certain things will grow in these regions mountainous region in the lowlands and so on certain things will grow there and other things will not that is not very successfully and so that is the reason that I have spent this much time talking about this and continuing tonight to talk about it. so here I wanted you to say something about the green and this should be a, a bit of a different color over here like, uh, do you see the part that is heavy green? Let's see if I can understand that. I'm not getting anything. Still not getting anything. There we go. All right, see, that's a desert. Now, in the original color, that looks more yellow. And there is this area right along here. You see that's heavier green? You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. All right, and then but look up here. This is Israel. That part is Israel. And you see the green that comes down through there? The green that is up here? And what is that region called? Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent. See that? So out of all that land, you just have this Fertile Crescent and the rest of it is desert. And the people that live there are the Bedouin and the various uh, Arab tribes. That's the way it's always been. And they survive somehow, but not many cities are there because people just simply cannot live there and people do not go there and say, we're going to build our house here. <coughs> and you've got the situation of water too. So the water is an important factor to consider. Okay, I want to move now and talk about the wind. The wind is very important. We'll talk first about the west wind. 
The west wind is actually important. It is from the northwest coming down across the country. This is the way the rains come in. This is the way the snow comes in. It comes from the north of Israel and from the west to the east and the south, going to the east and south. Okay, so the northwest is where the weather comes from, and we'll find examples of this. It's what brings the storms on the Sea of Galilee. They typically will come up sometime in the afternoon uh, as the sun goes down. And I have seen two or three of these. I have been told of others by men who are the captains of the tourist ships out on the boats out on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, other people have told me of seeing these as well. So it's something that we do see in the country today. And uh, I had a little experience when I was, uh, I edited the Truth and Life Bible class literature years and years ago. And uh, I had some students at the college to do the artwork for the lower grades, in other words, the elementary grades and the preschool and so on. And uh, one young lady had an assignment to draw the storm that came up on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus was there. So I don't know, I guess I didn't tell her, uh, you know, anything about it. Just these are the assignments, these are the chapters and so on. So when she brought it to me, she brought two drawings. I'm sure I still have them, both of them, a copy of them. And uh, one of them showed a big storm, a big storm and rain. And the other one showed a big storm without rain, but she didn't know which one to use. And so I told her what I'm going to tell you. See, there is no rain associated with those. It is the afternoon wind <coughs> that comes down about the time the sun is going down and this heat that is built up in this depression, which is 700 feet or more below sea level. And now the wind comes down out of the mountains into this lower region and that stirs up the sea. And it's exactly what happened in the time when Jesus and his disciples were there as it happens today. And it brings these storms in. Uh, there's a little place called uh, the Church of the Beatitudes. No, not that. It's the Church of, it's a Tabga. If you've ever been there, it's called Tabga. And uh, they say that this is where the 5,000 were fed. I don't know if it's the right place or not, and it really doesn't matter where I always tell people about those traditional places as we go to them that uh, it may not have been right here but it was here See? you need to understand that if you go there and you look around and they tell you this is the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prayed right here well he may not have prayed right here but he prayed right here got it you understand it's that simple because it's not far, it couldn't be far, because there's Jerusalem, there's the wilderness of Judea. It had to be right here, See? but not this specific spot. So it really doesn't matter whether, in, in many instances, whether it is this specific spot or not. It was here, and it was very close to the places that we are looking at. So I don't know if this is Dalmanuta or not but it might be but this is a suggestion that's the sea of galilee the north west corner would be there if you could see the water from that point it's mentioned only in mark 8 and verse 10 but somewhere in the region was mountain uh, Mal, uh, that's that place i mentioned <laughs> what is it called there dalmanutha, dalmanutha that's right all right so then here is the afternoon sunset. You see, that's what's causing that nice bright uh, look there. And look at those clouds. You know what direction I'm pointing? Northwest. Northwest. And it's coming right down on the sea. 
And I don't think this is going to work. Corey, I need help <laughs> on this one. And I was going to try to get to you sooner, but I can't make it work. I'm, it worked one time on my computer and I heard all the noise, but it still didn't move the picture. So I got the noise, but not the picture. But right there, I happened to stop one afternoon late. This was one of these personal trips with a friend who had been on the regular tour. And we were getting, going to out of the way places. So we went up overlooking from the northwest, overlooking the Sea of Galilee for pictures. And while we were there, it was as calm as could be. And suddenly, I mean, suddenly, that wind picked up. This little video that I made on my camera shows these trees and the bushes and everything just blowing, and blowing, and blowing. And the sound is terrific when it came down through there. So that's the way it happens. Not every afternoon, perhaps, but many afternoons, especially when it's hot on the Sea of Galilee. It didn't make a sound, but see, it took two clicks to get past it. <laughs> I'll have to take it to the garage. <laughs> okay, now the east wind. The east wind that comes from out on the desert. In Egypt, the east wind is called the Khamsin, or another pronunciation is the Hamsin. It's also known as the Shirako by many of the people that I've heard describe. In fact, that's more common to hear that. Then there is the wind from the east, and I wanted to show you these pictures that Carl Rasmussen has. He's the author of the uh, Zondervan uh, Pictorial Bible Atlas, which is an excellent source. It's available in a regular atlas and also in a little smaller that has most of the maps in it and just a, an abbreviated form of some of the information. And this was in May 2007. He was there teaching at the Hebrew University College. And uh, this is what happened. And in addition, you've got references to this in Pharaoh's dream and also at the time of the Exodus, just a strong winds. Now, this from the Jerusalem University College, which is in the in the southwest corner of the city of Jerusalem, the old city. And across the valley that is there, that's the Begin Center, named after Begin, probably one of the prime ministers. And you look at this church building, and the church building under A, normal, that is a Scottish church. That ridge, incidentally, I do have a picture on it, that ridge that goes out to the left, I'll get this going, that ridge that goes right there, that's higher than where we are in Jerusalem. So that is the water parting route. Jerusalem is on the east slope of the water parting route. All right, now then, this place is significant. I mean, behind it, there's a tomb and that's where, right behind it, it's the tomb where they found those, you've seen the pictures of them, the little jewelry worn in 600 B.C., about the time the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Has anyone heard of that? Do you know what they say? No. What? The oldest scripture ever found. The oldest scripture ever found. No, it's not a picture. No, scripture. 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 Oldest scripture. And it says in Hebrew, the Lord bless you and keep you. It's number six. It is our oldest reference. There are two of them actually. And they have that written on them. So people wore those and were buried with those. Isn't that interesting? People back then are just like people today. And uh, so this place though was looking like that. Then what happened? Ah, the Khamsin, the Shirako King. That's the next day. 
They say, everybody, several people, the last time I mentioned this, we get the sand off the Sahara Desert here sometimes. You can just see it. Things are red. Your car turns red a little bit. It comes all the way from Africa. Well, this is exactly what happened there. So here comes this from the from from the uh, uh, the direction that we're talking about from the east, and that building is just covered in the sand. Bill, does it take the paint off of the building? I mean, does it come strong? Like I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I try to stay out of the painting business. <laughs> I really don't know. I suppose it could, but it's bad on the sinuses. I do know that for sure. And I go in shops, I remember, and men that I've met before, you know, and they said, oh, I can't, this is so bad. This, I mean, not this particular one, but when the Scirocco comes, and they say, oh, my sinuses are bothering me just terrible here and I could relate to that it would be that way okay then there's the east wind again more east wind and there are references in the Bible to this Psalm 84 verse 48 verse 7 says by the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish <coughs> Tarshish is where where do we think it is Spain, Spain. Spain. somewhere in Spain probably and that's where Jonah was going to try to get away, you know, at first. But there's a reference to it. And then regarding Tyre, it says, Tyre is just north in the Lebanon mountain range. It says, your, your rowers have brought you out in the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. And so the east wind was very strong uh, on those ships that were going out the Phoenician ship that we have. That was a model ship uh, there at that, I mean, one that's been rebuilt in modern times. Okay, notice what Elihu says about this. Uh, did I skip one? There we go. No? What happened? Elihu. Elihu. Do you know the balancing of the clouds? the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge, you whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind. They talked about the wind. They complained about the weather in Bible times. And then when we look to the next one of these, you see Jesus mentions a south wind. He said, when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. What do we do? We say we got a front coming. My knees are hurting. Right? My arms are hurting. That arm I got hurt. It's bothering me. My sinuses are beginning to stop up. We know the weather. And what did Jesus do to the people? I didn't include that verse. But he got after them, didn't he? You know the weather. You know the signs of the time. You don't understand those. And so you can you can understand the weather. So why not understand these things as well? And then he said, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather. Why? Because the sky is red. It's not all cloudy over there. You see the brightness of it. And so you know that tomorrow will be a good day. And he said, you know it'll, when it's red and threatening you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. So there's the reference to that. And then again, notice how his ministry was affected by the weather and it's acknowledged. It said at that time, this is in John 10, at that time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. You know what Feast of Dedication is called by the Jews today? Hanukkah. All right, it's, uh, it's Hanukkah. And so it's a celebration of the defeat of the Syrians who came, the uh, Seleucids, who came and who you know, defiled the temple. They went into the temple area and burned the pigs on the altar. 
and of course that wouldn't go over well with the Jews or with God. And so it says it was winter. Now this occurs, this, this holiday occurs at what time to us? Christmas. December, yeah. So it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colony of Solomon. We tend to call those today, archaeologists would use the term porticos, the portico. So this model of Jerusalem, this is the Temple Mount section of it. This shows you the temple. It shows you the walls around the temple. It's the temple platform as it was built by Herod the Great. And this is exactly where he would have been. And when you look at this, you will see the porticos. And the porticos are, I don't know, the porticos are right here. You see those? That's exactly the way they were. How do we know it's exactly the way they were if the temple's gone? What did Josephus told about it, in addition? And not only that, when you go to the city of Jerusalem and you go to the wall that was built right here, this wall, not that wall, it's on the far corner over there. When you go to that wall where Saul called Robinson's Arch is located, it really was a little portion that came out for steps that went down to take people from that <coughs> corner uh, over there. And when you go there, you can look at all of that and then see what? You can see all this debris that the Romans pushed off of the platform down in the valley. So you know what it looked like. All of the columns are down there. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And they were left there until just a few decades ago when the archaeologists cleaned off all the dirt and there they were. So see, we know these things are so just exactly like this. This is about the accuracy of the Bible too. You know, I told you about the agreement of what? McGarvey called it the agreement of book and land. Book and land. And so there is agreement of all of these things. Okay? Moving further. Uh, I told you, what did I call the, the Jordan River? The Hidden River. Hidden River, I used the word, three letter word, shy. 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 It was shy. It doesn't show its face very much. And south of the Sea of Galilee, there are very few places that you can see it. North of there, it's easy to see. But when you go here, this is south of the Sea of Galilee, and you see it's made a little pond there. And then you see how it continues, and the way it continues is down through here. Maybe there, right there. See that? A little bit of water. See a little water? All right, <coughs> now let's continue. Long way. And then the continuation of this is right here. Wait for it. Oh, it, you talk to it, it's nice. <laughs> it this is like people. All right, and see, see, the, see right there where the corner is inside that. See, there it goes. Right along there. All right, see over here, what are these? The mountain range. Which side are we on? East. We're on the east side. See, we're in, the, we're in the valley between Israel and Jordan today. And see, it's just exactly. So it gets hidden, and what is that fence there? That's the border between Israel and Jordan. What is that road there? That's the patrol road. What is that that looks like it's just been gotten ready to plant a crop? Wheat. Wheat. What? Wheat? Wheat? No. It's just the road, and every night, on Israel's side, they go along and rake it. And on Jordan's side, they go along and rake it. And why is that? 
cross. The next morning they go around and look and see if there are any footprints. <laughs> <laughs> so that way they can report on the news two people across the border last night. <laughs> or however many. So it's easy to say this is an important thing. You'll need to know if you need to keep people out of your yard. Our <laughs> <laughs> fence won't do it. If you go take a rake with you. <laughs> take your rake with you. <laughs> take it to <laughs> That's a way to do it. Okay, so now continuing on further, uh, I told you that the weather was different this last March. It, it was really, it was 10 degrees cooler than normal at that time of the year. It was, uh, it should have been 50, 50, 52 in the daytime. It was like 40, 42. And uh, Leon and I, of course, we stop just anywhere we want to and make pictures. And this is always the way when you're individual, you can't do that on the bus. You've got to keep going because you have a schedule you've got to keep and so on, places to see and people to, people to see, people to take to see them. And uh, so we're going along here. And uh, this is a view south, actually. It would be a little south into the west because that's beginning to see the mountain range there. And we just saw so much interesting weather after a little while, we got to talking about it, and uh, one of us said, well, let's just study the weather. <laughs> because the weather is important in Bible times, see? So that's what we did for the rest of the day. We studied the weather. So I wanted to share that weather study with you. Not all of this was done that day, but this will give you some idea of what we're talking about. <coughs> now let's go up to the city of Jerusalem. This is from the west, looking toward and this would be the Temple Mount right up here. There's the Temple Mount where you see the Dome of the Rock. That's the old city of Jerusalem, the eastern side of the wall. This is the Kidron Valley. This is the Mount of Olives right here with tombs on it. These are the Jewish tombs. Over there are the Arab tombs, all over against the wall of the city. Okay, so we've got Kidron Valley. <coughs> Kidron Valley is right here. A lot of interesting things there. David crossed that when he left. The Bible mentions it. He was in Jerusalem. He crossed the Kidron with his family and headed away into a form of exile at the time. And those look like beehives, but they're not. They're tombs. So we look here. What do we find? There's a storm over Jerusalem. You see, I'm in the wilderness of Judea at this picture. You see the storm coming? Where, which direction is it coming from? You know for sure it's coming from the west. It's coming from the northwest. Right? Alright. So now, we now turn around near there, near Big Mash, and we look down to the Jordan Valley. What do you see down there in the Jordan Valley? It's a lot of clouds, right? All right. And what do we see up there in the distance? The mountains of what? Transjordan Plateau. Got it? So now we're looking across it over at those things. All right. More. This is the wilderness at sea level. Now, from here back toward Jerusalem, and while we were there in March, you would find a fine green velvet look to it. And the sheep really enjoy that. So people are there with the sheep all the time. If they go out here, they can get it. I'm telling you, a dry root and they can eat it. They get right to it. Now, Here's a storm over Transjordan. That's the same storm that I showed you was coming. So that's over the mountains of Transjordan. All right? You remember what the enemy said about the Israelites? Their God is a God of the mountains. Because where did Israel live? Mostly in the mountains. Mostly in the mountains. 
why didn't they live in the valleys? What? Philistines? Philistines? Uh, that's on the coastal plain. And maybe even before they got there, why didn't they move into the valleys? Would it, be a, it wouldn't be a safe place. The valley could be. The valley wouldn't be a safe, that's true. And there's a second reason where are you going to grow your crops? In the valleys. They're fertile. I mean, we could talk about Ahab's palace at Jezreel. It's in the valley. And Naboth's vineyard, where was it? In the valley. And I'll show you later, I'll find the references and give them to you, uh, where the Bible says that you live in the valleys, and they said we don't have enough space to grow our crops. They actually complained about it. And then they started doing what? Terrace farming. Good to see each of you. We'll see you next time. And we hope to get to the question. The question about is this a land flowing with milk and honey? <laughs> it's a good segue, right? Yeah, it's it's a good teaser. Kevin?